Okay, we are back. I'm very happy to have on the Goldstein on Gelt show best-selling financial writer and author Roger Lowenstein, who has a new book called America's Bank, The Epic Struggle to Create the Federal Reserve. Roger, why was it an epic struggle? Doug, the United States sort of has a founding political conflict that goes back to the time of uh, George Washington, uh, Alexander Hamilton, and Thomas Jefferson. Americans have always been very afraid of big government, central government. Uh, that goes back to the very beginnings, as I said, when we rebelled against the English crown. And um, it, it continues up to this day. If you follow American politics now, you can see it in the Tea Party and uh, resistance to things uh, uh, that in other countries uh, take for granted, such as national health care. And it's had a particular manifestation in finance. People in America are very afraid of big financial institutions. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was a uh, uh, third president, of course, and a founder. Uh, Andrew Jackson was another early president in the early 1800s. And for uh, all throughout the 19th century, when uh, every nation in Europe, basically every developed country, realized that they needed a lender of last resort to organize and stabilize their financial system, America resisted. And um, this, this um, book is about what was indeed an epic struggle to bring America uh, fully into the 20th century. So, uh, you know, I want to talk about the book, but really you're raising something which doesn't quite sit with, to me, what seems like the facts on the ground, which is I personally am a little bit afraid of huge government and huge financial institutions. But, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Look how big the institutions and the governments are today. So it would seem that the, the goals of the founding fathers seem not to have really come to pass. Well, the Fed is obviously much bigger uh, than the, the people who created the Federal Reserve 100 years ago uh, could have imagined. It's more involved, intricately involved in the American economy. But um, they very much had in mind uh, uh, an organization, a bank, that would come to the rescue of the American economy, that, that would be, uh, as the phrase has it, a lender of last resort in times of crisis. The, the, the Fed, the, the impetus for founding the Federal Reserve, which occurred in 1913, was the 1907 panic when hundreds of banks had to shut their doors uh, and, and there was no uh, government lender of last resort. So I, I think if the founders came back, although the, the shape of the Fed would be bigger than they had anticipated, you know, the various of its tools and mechanisms would surprise them. The fact that we, during the, the recent financial crisis in, 19, in 2008, we had a Federal Reserve making loans, resuscitating the economy, I think all that would, would jive very much with... Um, what their purpose was. One of the the ideas of the Fed, I think maybe in their charter even, is that it is supposed to create a stable economy. What does a stable economy really mean? And is our economy today really stable? Well, the the exact uh, phrase is a stable currency. And that's um, that's uh, a big difference. So what they had in mind by stable currency was the currency that uh, didn't suffer from inflation. Um, now, there were various people, populists and so on. Um, William Jennings Bryan was a, a very famous American uh, statesman, ran for office a few times. Um, and he argued that stable currency should also mean stable in the other way, meaning uh, be protected against deflation, that the money shouldn't grow stronger, uh, which might sound like a curious concern. But for 30 years uh, before the founding of the Fed, uh, prices fell. When we say prices fell, that's another way of saying the value of the dollar rose uh, year after year. And this was very difficult for people like farmers who, um, say, would have debts at uh, fixed rates and then they'd sell their products each year, wheat and corn and so on, for less and less money. So um, the the meaning of stable uh, was debated, and Congress in the 1970s uh, added a new, an additional function to the Fed, which was to promote uh, economic uh, growth uh, and employment. So, so now really there are um, two mandates for the Fed. One is to make sure that the value of the dollar is roughly um, uh, stable, and uh, uh, Fed chairs such as Ben Bernanke have interpreted that as, as meaning just a little bit of inflation each year. And the other is to make sure that the economy doesn't completely go off the rails. <laughs> We're talking with Roger Lowenstein, the best-selling financial writer and author. His newest book the, is about the, the Fed, the founding of the Fed. It's called America's Bank, the Epic Struggle to Create the Federal Reserve. Roger's been explaining to us some of the the core principles that went into starting the Fed. Now, Roger, I want to sort of dive in on this issue of a stable currency. It would seem to me 
and I'm, I'm not a world-famous economy economist, but there are certainly those who claim that with interest rates at historic lows and having continued for years and the, the federal debt go, getting bigger and bigger, the only way eventually to pay it off is simply going to be to print dollars till they, they have no value anymore. And so it seems that the Fed, which is the body responsible for interest rates, keeping them so low, is actually doing the opposite of what it's supposed to do. It's going, it's causing the ultimate demise of the dollar. Am I off base here? Well, the, you're very much um, in concert with what a lot of people have been predicting. Uh, obviously, people on the other side have been saying no. So far, those predictions have not come to pass. I just want to say two things um, relative to that. One is that, you know, people say loosely the Fed is printing money, you know, as if sort of Janet Yellen, you know, next to her kitchen, she has a big printing press. Um, <laughs> what, what she actually, what the Fed it's has in, actually... It's in her garage, it, not in the kitchen. Yeah, it's the garage now, right? It's a, it's a plug-in. It's, you know, electric. But um, what the Fed actually does is it creates reserves in banks. Uh, and it, that's one step, but the next step is just as important. That step is the banks have to lend those reserves uh, out to people uh, or, or businesses. If that doesn't happen, money doesn't enter the system. You know, it, it, I sort of grew up in the 70s, witnessed that terrible inflation that we did have, and I would have expected it was very easy to raise the inflation rate. Yeah, ben Bernanke said all we have to do is, you know, we could just go up in the sky and drop money from a helicopter or, or you know, uh, over the Capitol building or something. But actually the Fed has had, has been trying now for five or six years to get the inflation rate a little higher to try and stimulate the economy, creating all these bank reserves. But it turns out there just aren't, the, people aren't that optimistic about the economy. They're not doing a lot of borrowing and investing. And it's been a lot tougher than, than um, you or I might have thought. Secondly, if you, if you go back, because I, I sort of sense a monetarist lurking in you or in that question <laughs> to the, the early seventies when, um, that well-known liberal Richard Nixon cut the, the gold tie and, and took uh, the dollar off gold. People then predicted that, you know, that would be it for the dollar on international bourses. Nobody would ever want dollars again. Of course, the opposite has happened over the decades and particularly in crisis periods, which we always seem to be in one of. Uh, the dollar has become more and more valued. The, the, the real anchor to the dollar isn't, in my opinion, the metal or the assets behind it. Um, it's the fact that only dollars allow you to buy goods and services in the American economy. And the American economy remains the strongest in the world, the most transparent, the one with a legal system that, uh, backed by a legal system that people around the world trust. It's, it's those sorts of things that preserve the value of the dollar, uh, not a vault in Fort Knox or something. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we knew it wasn't a vault, and I, I, maybe I shouldn't dwell on this, uh, on this point, but I, I will simply note that the, the debt in the time of Richard Nixon was considerably less than it is now, and it just seems that, you know, with, with the amount of taxes that I pay, I don't see how the, uh, <laughs> how the government's ever going to pay it off. Um, it just seems very difficult, and I feel that if it's the Fed's responsibility to do that, then maybe they're not keeping to their original charter. That's my concern. Well, it's, it's not the Fed's responsibility to pay off the debt. Of course, it's, you know, the debt is, is held by the Treasury. The, the, the debt, the, the, um, Treasury's debt, now the, the government deficit now as a percentage of GDP is not out of line. It's what, what is it, 3% or something? It was very high, as you'd expect, and as you'd want during the crisis, you, if, in, unless you've repealed Keynes, and I haven't. Uh, but, but the idea is that government should, uh, you know, prime the press during uh, crises, and the government did briefly. But right now it's back to, uh, uh, 3% or so for, so for a growing economy, just as a family can carry debt that's in proportion to its income, uh, it's not out of line. And if you look at the countries around the world that have decided, hey, we're going to fix our economic problems by via austerity, hasn't worked so well. Mm -hmm. All right. So let, let's, as we're wrapping up, we only have another minute or two. Uh, let's go back again and talk about history, because that's what your book really is about. At the time when the Fed first opened in 1913, the, the U.S. economy was have, undergoing a radical change from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy. It feels today as though we're also moving in a radically new direction as information technology is taking over. Is the Fed set up to deal with this kind of change? Well, you're right that, that the early 1900s were a time of um, industrial uh, transformation, and uh, this year is too. I think that the constant in both is that uh, as long as we have a, a system of private capitalism and we have credit, the, uh, private credit, there are going to be times when that credit is withdrawn, when 
when lenders are nervous. And the herd instinct being what it is, I know you're a student of Daniel Kahneman, uh, no one's repealed uh, that aspect of human nature, the herd behavior. <laughs> there are going to be times when creditors uh, retreat en masse. And the, in those periods in particular, the lender of la the necessity for having a lender of last resort as Walter Badgett, the, the uh, you know, Victorian era British economist, said, uh, an organization to lean uh, against the wind uh, when everyone else is running with it uh, is the same, whether we're talking about uh, you know the digital age or the industrial age. So we, we've touched on the lender of last resort a couple of times in this conversation. One of the complaints that people have about the system and the banking system is that the banks who are insured by the FDIC are not really paying premiums that are reasonable for the amount of, of insurance that they're getting, meaning if it was a free market, then they would in fact have to pay a much higher premium, which would mean lower interest rates ultimately to the to the depositors, but it would mean that it would be a, a I, well, hopefully it would be more transparent, but it would be a more fair system. If we were to switch to a system where the government wasn't just the lender of last resort there to bail out the banks, but rather an effective uh, the, we're, we're, rather, the government would have an effective system to make sure the banks don't take on undue risk and then just know the government will bail them out one day. Wouldn't that make the system stronger? Well, I take issue with the phrase uh, bailout. So what the Fed does is, you know, 2008 was an extraordinary circumstance, but what, what the Fed does is provide credit, only credit to solvent uh, organizations. Um, the, the, Fed, the purpose of the Fed isn't to bail out um, banks. Uh, and the, the FDIC, uh, you know, it has to set its interest rates at, at, um, you know, in a sense, a market based, um, uh, with a, a market based evaluation of what the real risk is. And that was obviously too low. They and others misjudged the risk of, um, uh, of mortgage securities going into, including the Fed misjudged the risk of mortgage securities going into the, uh, you know, bubble and what became the bust. But, um, you know, the experience, the, if you don't have a deposit insurance, you, you know, and our experience previously, you're inviting these mass uh, runs to the bank and that um, uh, tip over not only insolvent organizations, but of course, what always happened in these runs was solvent organizations because of the herd uh, behavior aspect that I spoke of. So I, I would not be in favor at all of uh, repealing um, deposit insurance. Actually, I wasn't suggesting repealing it. Rather, my idea was that the insurance should come from, should be available from other countries as well. Imagine you walked into Bank of New York and there was a sign that said, we're not insured by the FDIC of the United States, but by the German FDIC, for example. So then it would be a free market where the banks get insurance and you and I would know better to only go to banks that are insured. And you say, well, I trust, for example, that the German government could bail out my bank better than the U.S. Well, government. Well, you, you say you and I would know better, but in fact, uh, throughout time, you know, so I'm going to be a little bit um, nanny statish and say, <laughs> in fact, throughout history, um, uh, depositors have not known that. And the financial system is too delicate uh, to trust. Uh, this is what Alan Greenspan said when he was asked about derivatives, uh, that um, if uh, private lenders are making these contracts per force, uh, they must be uh, prudent. And he said that with respect to uh, uh, derivatives based on mortgage securities in the, you know, the early 2000s. Uh, markets are usually smart. They can do very dumb things sometimes. All right. So, we, so Doug, yeah, we'll have to leave. You, now. Asked me, you <laughs> haven't asked me about something, which you have to ask me about. Okay. The hero of this book is a German Jew. You got to ask about it. <laughs> so is it true that the Jews ran the economy in starting the Fed? Um, you know, uh, over time, the Fed has been a magnet, unfortunately, for um, various conspiracy theories and also at times, uh, uh, most unfortunately, for uh, fringe anti-Semitism and so on. But um, the fact is that um, the intellectual father of the Federal Reserve of the United States was a German Jew who um, emigrated uh, from Hamburg to New York in 1902, a man named Paul Warburg. Uh, he was a banker, but um, really more interested in the philosophy um, uh, behind banking rather than the sort of grubby everyday business of making loans. And Warburg saw um, uh, much sooner and much more clearly than his adopted countrymen uh, the faults in, in the American system. Uh, he, as he put it, the banks in America suffered from uh, an extreme ethos of individualism. And by that, he meant that each bank kept its own reserve in its vault, if you will, 
uh, and out of fear that there would be such a panic, banks locked up a tremendous amount of the lending power uh, of the country rather than circulated in loans. You know, Warburg, very vivid pen, and he likened the banking system to a town that lacked a, a central reservoir, and, and, you know, and, and in which each home maybe had a pail of water in its backyard. It was a terribly inefficient way uh, to organize a banking system. He, he, he was a remarkable, both in his insight and um, for the passion with which he pushed this idea. And, and he became one of the first governors of the, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, after becoming a citizen in, um, in 1914. And I think one of the best ways that people can learn more about this, Roger, is from your book. So we're just about out of time now. Tell us in the last few seconds, how can people follow you and follow your writing? Well, you can find uh, the book and uh, my other writings on my website, uh, not very complicated, www.rogerlowenstein.com. You can order uh, America's Bank there and, of course, on sites such as Amazon and others. Okay, and we will put links to that to that at the show notes of today's show at goldsteinongelt.com. Roger Lowenstein, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Doug. It was a real pleasure. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show. 